Welcome to the Wild Ones Podcast, the show where we talk about bike stuff. I'm Francis, this is Jimmy, and how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I've, I've heard uh, a rumour from uh, a little a little birdie, or pigeon, a room? called Sue, that it's uh, your 38th birthday this week. It, it is. It is. It's my birthday tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah. I should probably know 38. <laughs> your whole act, so that yeah. makes you something like four months older than me. The people that... I didn't know. I didn't know. I always assumed you were like, I don't know, like 26 or mm. something. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I had a little celebration at the weekend. Oh. I do actually feel 38. I thought you'd have invited me. You were there. Oh, yeah. Do you know I was that? there? No, I did. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was there, wasn't I? Yeah. It was the margaritas. It was. Yep. <laughs> Let's get into the debris. Straight into the podcast, yeah? The new specialized. The, the, the thing is, though, are, are people now going to be like, oh, I thought he was older than that? Because that's what they do for me. Oh, and they were surprised than, yeah, that you and, were. And then they're going to learn that actually you're 30. They thought you were older two? than 50. How old are you actually? 31. You're going to be 31, are you going to be? I will be 31, 31. tomorrow. Yeah. Not 30, yeah. I probably look older than 31. I feel older than 31. You do look it as well, yeah. Specifically after the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> the new specialised Tarlac SL8 has been released. It's been all over YouTube. It's been all over the usual websites and magazines. Apparently, it's lighter, stiffer and faster. <sighs> Where, when has a bike not been that when a new one's been released? Probably never. How is it well, possible? Like bike packing bikes and stuff. How is it possible that all brands number one and number two road bike are continuously lighter, stiffer and faster? Well, I think the technology is getting better. But they must be holding it back so that they can just say it again the next year. Almost definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a long like pipeline. I mean, they know what they're doing for the next five, six years, don't they? Like, well, perhaps. According to Specialized, it's 15% lighter which is 115 grams lighter, which is actually quite a, Is that the whole bike or is that... That'll be the frame. That's just the frame. Yeah. Quite a lot lighter. 6% more compliant. Whoa, 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 whoa. 115 grams a lot lighter. <laughs> 115 <laughs> grams. That's 15%. There's a lot. Just don't take a sip of your water. Okay, yeah, well, in terms of total rider system, yes, it's not that much. But in, in, if, you, if you're one of those people who wants to make a bike really light... You're building one. Quite life, right? Six percent more compliant than the SL7. Few point ten any difference. Has an improved stiffness to weight ratio to the tune of thirty three percent. It's all just not, it means nothing. None of this information to means anything. Is that from specialized website? Yeah. Sixteen point six seconds faster over forty K an hour. Sorry, over forty K. Twenty five miles. Uh, the frame set costs. Four thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds, which is not much more than last year's one. Well. Two hundred fifty quid more. Yep. They were around the five grand mark for these top end carbon frames. The pro carbon version, so not the S Works version, is three thousand pounds. I. Um, it makes it feel good value because the other one's really expensive. <laughs> well, three grand is still very expensive. <laughs> Just for the frame <laughs> set. <laughs> Even if you put like cheap everything on it it's still going to be a four and a half thousand pound a hundred percent i like with all of these releases people are still going to buy it some people can afford it and if they have the money then fine is it going to make any difference compared to the old bike not really well definitely not no. we're not going to notice any difference no i think i think the bit that i dislike most about road bikes at the minute is they all pretty much look identical mm. and even when new ones come out like it just looks the same i know i know it's not like it doesn't have to look different every time but like i don't know you just want to get excited about something and getting excited about 115 grams is just not me mm -hmm. like i like i remember when the old specialized came out the sl it was probably the sl6 at that point mm. when it, when they went from curved to flat i was like oh that is that is smart it was like a big change because it was a big change and it was like there hasn't been a big was, change in was, a few years it was exciting you, yeah but but it's yeah. not it's not i'm definitely not just specialized it's across the board like they all just kind of look the same if you look at the top end bikes across the board they've all got dropped well nearly all of them have got drop stays at the back they're very flat they're very bulbous in certain bits and mm -hmm. I don't know, I think it's really I just think road cycling is just getting boring to be honest the I guess Specialized are a bit different to other but they because they dropped their aero specific frame entirely from the range 
So they don't make the Venge anymore. Yeah, but they're all aero specific frame. It is aero still. Yeah. It is really fast, apparently, if you believe the numbers. Um, yeah. I don't know. It, you're right. Nothing, nothing exciting has happened for quite a few years. Nothing really exciting, like nothing drastic. Where do you think the design will go? What, would you, do you think there is going to be a change soon? No. What can happen? Well, like the only, the only kind of what, what will potentially happen is either they'll continue to be driven by performance, which just means that it'll just kind of be little minor tweaks. And then every year or every couple of years, they bring out a new bike and they're like, oh, it's 4% faster at cornering at 500 miles an hour if you're doing it on the back wheel only or something stupid like that. Or they're going to just have to... Like, as if, um, they're, they, so with, bike brands tend to borrow technology from other manufacturers like yeah. motocross or other sports other vehicles what's the right word I'm looking uh, for Jimmy um, <laughs> things things <laughs> for example the, the I filmed a video with Nick the other day and he's been banging on about these gravel wheels from Zip Nick and they use, Mechanic Nick, Nick yeah, yeah. Nick, Mechanic Nick and they have these, these Zip gravel wheels have borrowed some technology from motocross where the spoke and the rim like pivot slightly so when you're cornering and absorbing bumps, it's supposed to reduce fatigue. So it's less bumpy mm. and things like that. So I, th there is little snippets of innovation, innovation or theft. Well, classified hub. When that came out, I thought that was quite cool. You put in all your hubs, you put all your gears into the rear hub. Mm -hmm. well, it's like a rear mech in a, a front mech in a rear hub. And you can still fit a cassette to it. So you're like hiding things away. Mm -hmm. And everyone moaned about it and just goes, oh, it's stupid. Why, well, you know, like they're just coming up with stupid. Dinner. But like the companies are making an effort to innovate. And I like tech. It's cool. Is, is it? It's not innovation though, is it? Because it already existed as a product. The it did exist has... as a product. Yeah. Yes, but not with it where you could put a cassette on as well. Yeah, I know. But it's not that much of a change really, is it? Mm. I don't think it, I don't really think that's much innovation. I Being think. able to shift under load, it's like a really high. It's it's a it's a um, a performance focused planetary hub, and yeah. I guess that's where things will. I feel like that's where things will go. Gears inside, sealed, so the maintenance is less. But you can, you can get like, and you've got a, 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 a if you think about road bikes in ten years time, everything will be hidden away, and like that's a cool that, that would be a big change. That would be exciting and different. But you can get already the classified thing but it's rather than in the hub it's at the bottom bracket and it's an oil they're usually belt drives but not necessarily always belt drives yes yeah. made by classified no, 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 no like there's other brands i can't remember what they're called um and it's basically like a sealed oil filled thing and there's just like in it and it's like you can change it a load it's instant mm. it happens and stuff like that there's loads there's loads of stuff out there i like a hub gear that's um shimano there's a durace one is there? Yeah, 11 speed in your rear hub. You can't put a cassette on, so it's yeah. instead of the cassette. Wowzers. So it acts as your, just your rear gears. Is this an old really good race? And surely not oh, a new yeah, product. Yeah, it's not. It's been around for a few years, but no one uses it because it's, it's a hub gear. Yes. It's weird and different, I suppose. But it's actually really cool and works extremely well. But it's only different to like road cycling. I imagine in the touring scene, there's loads of like yeah, internal loads of people. Stuff. People tour on belt drives, and the, mm. it's it's just different, isn't it? Yeah. The, I wonder if there's some of that technology will be brought over into the performance road scene. Perhaps. I imagine that's where it will go. My, my, the, the, the crux of what I feel about this, oh, crux, isn't that? A, a bike. That is a specialized bike. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I feel about seeing this launch is it bores me. Mm. I'm not excited to go out and buy a road bike. I'm, I still, my, I still am thinking, what's the point in having a road bike? I'm better off having a fast gravel bike that I can put slicker tires on or just not mm -hmm. than having a road bike mm -hmm. these days. These sort of numbers they're speaking about in terms of over the last year's model or even the year before that are really marginal. And we're talking performance focused people. They will notice a difference in their numbers potentially, but you're not going to notice feel. No. And, and even the people who notice it in the numbers, they're like, we're talking about like above the top 1% of cyclists. 
Oh, <laughs> we're not talking about like matey that does uh, less than that. Second, you reckon how many? For, I, we've have we talked about this off not in a podcast before? How many? What percentage of cyclists or people that ride a bike have done a race? And how many currently race? When you say a race as well, we're not talking about sporty. Things. No, we're talking a about race. actual like a crit or a road race. A road race, yeah. yeah. Tiny. Got zero it. point four. And if you're talking about zero cyclists three. as in like all cyclists, then it's <laughs> well, anyone who's like ever ridden a bike. 0. 0. Yeah. 0. 0. 0.01%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how many of them have raced the Strava segment? <laughs> Much more. <laughs> yeah. Much more. Which is fine. And if you want to do if you want to do a Strava segment and go as fast as possible, that probably will make it very slightly faster. However, a better solution would be to get an e-bike. An e-conversion kit will be cheaper than that bike, and you will definitely beat your times. And don't get caught. By whom? Strava police. Did you see that Peter Sagan has opened a hotel in his own likeness? I have not seen this. I'm not saying that the hotel is like a sculpture of him, but it's themed on him and his cycling I'm achievement. immediately disappointed. Are you? Yeah. Why? Well, if it was a sculpture of him, I'd be more likely to go and see it out of like curiosity. A, a Statue of Liberty, but like a Statue of Sagan. Holding uh, a green jersey. <laughs> so resorts based in Slovakia. In the town where he's from, as it's relevant, he announced the opening on Instagram saying it's a tailor-made for cyclists and that you'll be pampered like a celebrity. Ooh. Many of the rooms are themed around big races and have feature walls with photos of him slapped all over. Weird. They shared photos of the rooms on their Instagram page at sp.resort if you want to check them out, uh, podcast listeners. So let's have a look at the Flanders room. The carpet says 100, but not 100%. Maybe there was a copyright issue there. Um, for people at home, he's sponsored by... He's the, the, the poster boy yeah. for 100% Glass. glasses. Yeah. Behind the bed is a picture of... Is it, is it pronounced the mur? Is that what they call it? It's like the famous iconic bit of Flanders. I'll be honest, the bed doesn't look all that cool. Oh, there's more than one picture. It's like a marble-themed bathroom, which looks pretty bling. There's a humongous map of Flanders at the base of the bed, which then on the other side of it has a big fat TV and a little seating area. Fairly nice hotel room. It's all right. It's a bit like teenager's mm. bedroom. My favourite bit is the bathroom, which has no Peter Sagan-related or cycling things in whatsoever. Oh, I bet it has like Hans Grower shower thing yeah, and where you, you open the toilet a <laughs> picture of pizza again at the yeah. bottom well he was like biggest, his biggest biggest rival. Easy hand. Who's, who's his biggest rival maybe that so you just shit on his rival <laughs> <laughs> right what's the next room the tour de france room whoa that is green whoa the floor is green the walls are green the ceiling's gray everything else is pretty much gray there's a picture of him doing a thumbs up in a green jersey inside the outline of france that is not a nice room to be in. It's also not the right green. It's yellow. It's like too yellowy. The picture choices are weird. It's horrible. Oh, it's because he's in a yellow jersey. One of the pictures is it him in a yellow no, jersey. No, he's not in a yellow jersey. Oh. No, he is on the yeah, side. Okay, yeah, okay. But he's like grabbing a bag from a feed stop. But I guess it's because he's wearing yellow. Right, next room is the Giro d'Italia room. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's just exactly the same as the Tour de France one, but pink. It's not even pink, is it? It's more like magenta. The soft finishings don't match the carpet. They're giving you two mugs that say Giro d'Italia. Which you probably can't take home with you. Same bathroom as the other room. Uh, another collage. There's a, there's a consistent collage theme of like him at the event. It's a nice idea. But I don't think it's been executed with enough Check out the enthusiasm. Tour. Check out the Tour de Suisse room. They, it, they're trying to make it look like a chalet. A chalet, yeah. So yeah. Ba it's basically like wood, wood everywhere. But it looks a bit more like a treehouse slash shed. Wood sculpture. Um, wooden bed. Well, at least this room's different to all the others. Yeah, I guess it's got a bit of character. It, I guess it could. It looks a bit like a sauna without the sauna. It, it does look like a sauna. <laughs> if you really, really like Peter Sagan, I'm sure you're going to have a lovely time at that hotel. If Peter Sagan is at the reception checking you in mm. and then is like, I, I, I couldn't even attempt to do his accent. In his accent... Do it like, hey, do you want to go for a ride? I'd be like, that'd be kind of cool. I'd probably be like, hey, Francis, should we go make a video of Peter Sagan and go for a ride in, his, in, his, in Slovakia with him? 
I'd, I, would, I would try and convince you to do that, but I'm going to assume he's not going to be there. And on that basis, uh, I'm out. I like the concept. What is though. this? The Apprentice? Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I like, I guess it's, I guess it's, it shows how big psych, professional cycling can be that. He's the peak, he's what, highest paid rider ever? Or is that Froome? That can't it's be. It's him or Froome. Surely not anymore. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's him or Froome. Wow. Both of them were earning a lot of money in the last years of their. And I imagine a lot of that is, is not salary from their team, but is actually sponsorship. Because they've got, they've gone through the peak. You know, they're getting race results, big, you know, and they both slowed down yep. a little bit. But they still demand a very high price for their notoriety. As of last year, he was the second highest paid. Pogaccia is the highest paid. Pogaccia is the highest paid. And the producer, Emily, thank you. Yeah, it does make sense. Pogaccia, six million. Sagan, five and a half. Froome, five. Wow, the top end of pro cycling is wild, isn't it? Yeah, big. So, Francis, if you were going to make a hotel themed around your life, actually, we'll say maybe the, the Jimmy and Francis Hotel, the Cade Media Hotel... Should we get a Media Hotel? That'd be so funny. Uh, what... Based on how much effort it took to set up a, a small video <laughs> podcast and a studio, I don't want to build a hotel. So, right, we'll pretend that we're going to make the Cade Media Hotel. Yeah. What are our room themes? The Zelda room. Yes. It will have <laughs> the Link He Come to Town song on playing on repeat, seven. which we'll use as the outro to this podcast. <laughs> I, th I think, uh, yeah, th so that song plays on loop. It, yeah. There's no option to turn loud, it off. Loud. You only get the option to turn it down at night. Yeah. But it's always on. Yeah, yeah, it's always on, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I, I guess I guess probably what we would do is broaden it to uh, the gaming room. So, actually, a room where there's, like, computer consoles, a few arcade machines, maybe a pinball machine, and some, like, cool stuff, but it's, like, heavily Zelda. Thing. Okay, yeah, 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 that's fine, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, definitely a gaming room. Um... I I think we should have a, a reconstruction of the Cade Media Studio. One to one. W yeah, like exactly, exactly like how one to one, yeah. Where do people sleep? The sofa. Yeah, just the sofa. But not a sofa bed. Same same like a, the a, same a sofa. copy of the sofa. And you just have to like sleep on the sofa. With like bread and potato that Catherine's put on it. Yeah, underneath it, yeah. Catherine uh, is a child. But there is an option for for you know authenticism authenticity. 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 To make it authentic. We'll also have all of our bike packing gear on one of the walls that you can choose to use on the floor if you want. Oh, yeah, like a bivy. Yeah. 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 A fancy bivy. Um, and like a little, I don't know, a camping stove. I'm glad you've actually got used. sleeping bag. I've only got an emergency bivy. Yeah. Personally. I always borrow it off you. So, so they'll be there if you want them. Uh, and there'll be the sounds of construction played 24 7. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, and there'll be an echo. Fan, a heavy echo that annoys you. <laughs> 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 what other rooms do we have? Um, I would want. I'd personally want. Uh, I've always. I've always wanted this. Mm. A clock room. So just like all the walls completely covered with clocks that make ticking noises. Uh, it would be stressful or relaxing. yeah, incredibly stressful. Oh, okay, stressful. And and there's like a, I want it to be stressful. There's one chair in it, so it's so it sleeps one person. That's like a, a recliner chair, but like slightly uncomfortable. Yeah. And the clocks are just, but all at like different. Some of them are cuckoo clocks as well. Um, cuckoo but, clock Cuckoo, yeah Cuckoo Cuckoo, yeah Cuckoo That's what I said But then there's also a room next to it Which is a separate room Which is also sleeps one Which is a zen room Which has just got like nothing in it Oh Maybe a chair Like a prison No, you can get you can get yourself in and out You choose to be in there It's oh. a choice So there's a clock room A zen room We've got the, the recreation of the studio We've got the gaming room A studio will have a tax bike in a tax room. No, because we, it's already the tax bike and the turbo trainers are already here. Oh, in the, in the so you can do some exercises. Yeah, you can, yeah, 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 yeah. And then busy, but you can't have a shower. <laughs> you could. No, you because, could use the tap, or or just like a a a, a wet wipe style bike packing shower. Just like a, yeah, like a, a festival shower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I f I feel like it would be appropriate for us, us to have like a YouTube room, where. The walls, similar to the clock room, the walls are covered in cameras and they're constantly on and it's live streamed to the whole world. Cool. Yeah. And you get to choose to be in there. Zero privacy. I probably wouldn't visit our own hotel. Well, you do. It's our lives. <laughs> <laughs> live streaming. Yeah, we know it. 
<laughs> it gets 12 million views a second. But it's all worth it because Cade Media has hit 250,000 subscribers as of some days ago. <laughs> Happy birthday! <laughs> Just synced with my birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you for your help. And thank, thank you. you, producer Emily, for your help as well. And more importantly, thank you to the 250,000 people that have clicked subscribe. Now, we can flash up a picture. Danny got us some amazing 250K balloons, which are massive. I don't know how she got them here, but they're in the studio. There's a picture. When, when you first started YouTube, days. did you think you were going to reach 250,000 subscribers? I, think so. I haven't really thought about it that much. I think I, I think that you thought that you were going to be the next Casey Neistat and you were going to get 10 million subs. You reckon? Yeah. And I then, wasn't thinking that. And then, and then after your first video, you realised that it was an absolute pain in the ass. I'm like, actually, this is this is going to be a, a, a graft. It takes a while. <laughs> of course it takes a long time. Uh, I have another question. Yeah. Where do you think Cade... Well, actually, not even Cade Media. Where do you think your YouTube channel, which is currently the Cade Media YouTube channel, is mm -hmm. going to be in five years' time? Five years. Hmm. And I don't mean geographically. I mean, like, what, what's 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 going to be on this channel in five Based years? Based on how much it's changed in the last six months, which is how long you've been involved, mm -hmm. it could be anything. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I would say there's a high chance that it's a Zelda ded <laughs> dedicated channel. Yeah. And then we just sit around and talk about Zelda. Yeah. yeah. They only release a new Zelda, unlike Specialized, with releasing bikes. They only release a new Zelda every five years or so. I, I, like, the, I yeah. like the link there. That was good. That was good. So there'll be less content. Yeah. But arguably, you get more value out of one copy of Zelda than you do a Tarmac SL8. <laughs> good. Like good. A long way. <laughs> now on to our big question of the day. What tips would you give someone considering their first bikepacking trip? Don't do it. We already know <laughs> you don't like bikepacking. No, you think it's overrated. Yeah, I do, I do, do like enjoy it. it. I do like it. It's yeah. good. It's good. I've done a lot of bikepacking slash touring. Um, Whatever you want to call slept it. Slept in a few bushes. That's not really my thing. Rubbish. Uh, cycled across America. Cycled across Vietnam. Cycled across Australia. Did the whole um, west coast of the USA. Spain. Through the mountains in Spain. It's all been fantastic. I really Can enjoy it. Like Austria, Austria as well, or something like that. Switzerland. Oh, we rode to Switzerland. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, that was good. That. that was where we went to see some god. It was very fun. We got the ferry from here. We went to... straight there and zero <laughs> bike pack. That was that was the bike pack. There isn't a ferry that goes all the way to Switzerland. <laughs> sadly, in which case we would have. They had a disco on the ferry. It was wicked. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to go through a few things on today's podcast about well, a few tips. If you are considering your first trip. Mm -hmm. First one, location choice. I don't think people need to go. You, you see all these things. I've just listed off some really big, exciting rides. Your first trip doesn't need to be that. Or any of them, really. Any of them need to be. Yeah. No, exactly. That's the, the things that you've done are in basically every scenario, really significant events mm -hmm. that I think are almost too extreme for just like, normal people to to like aspire towards like it's cool if you end up doing it but you don't even need to think about like that's the goal to like ride across the country no no no, no. They, they, they they were long they were expensive you'd have to take time off work if you weren't working while doing them which i was because i was making videos mm -hmm. so i i would suggest a short local bike packing trip to just test out your stuff yeah as a first one like if that's if you're in newcastle you'd go ride to scotland Scotland, but yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's not a bad one. Like, well, we the borders. We, we rode. We rode to the borders. Yeah, and if you do it over like two or three days, then you can do, like, like we probably rode too much because day one was like nine hours. You're on mountain bikes as well. Well, you were on a mountain bike. I was on a gravel bike. Yeah, and we did it all on road. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we had originally planned to do some off road stuff. Well, it was going to be all off road. It was a little bit. And then I think we ran out of time, so we were like, well, we'll, we'll skip, we'll, we'll do some skip road a section. Before you know, it was only road. Yeah. The whole way. Because it was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, th I, think, I think that's a good point. Like doing something simple from your local area, or, or even, you know, it doesn't have to be from your front door, but like, you know, you could drive 
to the countryside mm-hmm. and then do a two day trip or a three day trip from there is a, is, is a sensible idea. Yeah, yeah. So it's essentially putting bags on your bikes and riding somewhere. Everything you have with you is on your bike or your person. And that creates an exciting vibe, I think. Mm. Uh, your bike's gonna feel a bit different. So it's important to test it before. It will feel heavier. However, it doesn't slow you down that much in the grand scheme of things. If you think about like hours, yes, when you're riding up a climb, you'll be like, oh, this is a bit of a slog. I'm going slower than usual. Yeah. But in time, elapsed time over the course of six, seven hours of riding in the day, yeah, you might be 20 minutes slower, half an hour slower. So I wouldn't worry too much about having a really heavy bike because I think that gets, um, you know, it worries people. So as part of equipment you you know you were saying you load up your bike it'll feel in a particular way i think the most underrated thing in all of cycling and especially when bikepacking is gear ratios Mm. like you are your bike is going to be heavier and the place that you're going to notice that is going up climbs yeah so just have more gear range so that you can just spin your way up it it's going to take longer it's going to be harder don't grind up and destroy your legs uh just on that but the the ultimate point is your bike is going to be heavier, but it's not that big a deal. It's all right. I guess this is most relevant for people who... who a lot of people watch the channel. They have racing bikes. Racing bikes tend to have big gears on. Yeah. As soon as you add some bags to that and your bike, it weighs 20 kilos or more. I did. I bike packed in Wales with uh, a racing bike that had rim brakes and carbon rims. And it was when we were filming. So I had a tail fin that was like 20 kilos on its own and it was honestly the most horrible thing i've ever experienced (laughs) i remember descending and thinking like yeah this is this is game game. over (laughs) carbon rims carbon rim does make a difference isn't it um and i'm guessing it was raining because it was wales it was actually yeah of course yeah (laughs) i definitely walked up some sections of that as well Mm -hmm. no shame in that well yeah i know i I didn't have an option i've seen some of the climbs um so yeah, weight is, you don't notice the weight as much as, as you think you would, but just get loads of gears. Just get, yeah. get tons and tons and tons of them. You're never going to need to be thinking about going fast downhill because your bike's going to be a bit heavier. You're going to fly down a hill anyway. Um, you fly down a hill until you don't because you're not very, you're big and the bags are big. So, so if you have a tiny headwind and you're going quite fast, <laughs> suddenly you just go, oh, I can't go any faster. Whereas a normal bike with nothing on it, you, you notice it, yeah. it goes but, th- but then if, you, if you're bikepacking, you're not thinking about... You don't care. ...speed anyway. Who cares? Yeah. No, true. So back onto the bags and key pieces of equipment that I always take with me. I would suggest food pouch, which are the small... They look like the little bags of chalk that climbers have. Mm-hmm. And you can strap those on the front of your handlebars. And you can... It's just like a, a, a drawstring on a small pouch. So you can put things in. I put my phone in there or food... You can even put loose food in if you wanted one of them to just be like trail mix or whatever. And it just, it's right in front of you as you're riding. Yep. So you don't have to unzip something. It's just there and you ride along and you can just eat from it. And I think eating little and often, so it works wonders on a trip like that. Because you, when you're in a new place, you're thinking about navigating, you're looking at the cool stuff, you're meeting people and having convenient food to eat quickly and easily. Yeah, make a big, big difference. I, I guess an alternative to that for someone that perhaps already has this piece of equipment is you could use a top tube bag if that's your preference. Top tube bag, yeah. I guess it's, it's, just, it's just the idea of something easily accessible, accessible right there. You leave your top tube bag zipped open and you can just get in and out. Of it. Yeah, a couple of times I've gone on trips. I think the one I did with you, I didn't take a food pouch with me. Yeah, thinking oh I'll be fine. It's only a short days. I'm only riding with Jimmy. I'll be fine. <laughs> and it was annoying. Yeah, and I wish I'd had one of those. So always take one of those. Uh, ski straps. This is another thing. They they're recycling specific ones called voile voile yeah. straps. V o i l e. They're very good. They're very good. You can buy straps that are made for skis. The the ones I have are black diamond ski straps, and essentially these are stretchy little ratcheted straps. So it's like a belt, and you can stretch these over your pack. Strap things to the outside of your bike. You can strap a tire, which is the next thing on the list. Always take a spare tire with you. You put that on the outside of your bike. It's waterproof. You, it's, nothing's going to go wrong with it. There's almost no reason other than a tiny bit of weight to carry a spare tire with you. And if you if you had a blowout, you hit a Vietnam day one. I hit like a razor blade on the floor on the ground. 
and it just my tubeless exploded everywhere and that was a trip i didn't have a spare tire with me finding a tire that fitted a gravel bike in vietnam was a pain in the ass mm -hmm. i ended up riding a conti uh a continental ultra sport the whole way across for 20 more days and if i just had a spare tire with me i learned my lesson is that, always take a spare tire is that the only occasion you've needed a spare tire no Oh, you did multiple change, times did across, the, America. across the USA. Yeah. yeah. But you think about your bikes. <clears throat> My USA setup, bike was 30 kilos, trailer was 20 with the wheelchair in. That's a 50 kilos of stuff. Adding a tire, which weighs 500 grams, 600 grams, is not going to be, it's not going to make a difference. But it will make a difference to your sustainability and peace of mind. I'm going to remind you of this next time you say that 100 grams makes is a good saving on a, a new frame weight. Two different types of riding storage. <laughs> oh, non-cycling footwear. I'm I'm a big believer of this. I always take trainers now. I did that thing. Chris used to come on bikepacking trips. He does a lot of bikepacking. Our friend Chris, and he always used to have those little rock pool shoes that you they like roll up mm -hmm. and they're very thin. But they just every time he walked anywhere, he looked very uncomfortable. Oh, what? And just take a pair of trainers. Well, I, th I think that's, that comes down to preference. Like, I've got some of those little dappy things. I think they're wicked. Mm. Like, when we went to Scotland, I was walking around in, like, the bushes. Do you have sliders? No, I use those little... Rock pool shoes? Yeah, yeah, ah. yeah. I think they're great. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I personally don't like sliders. If I was racing an ultra, and really you wanted to, you wanted to go fast, mm -hmm. a shoe that rolls up like that, I can see the benefit. Well, if you're racing an ultra, you probably wouldn't bother. You wouldn't need shoes. No, you'll just go in normal shoes. Yeah. Yeah. But like for bike packing, it's one of those like creature comforts, isn't it? Yeah. Where you go like you get back to the hotel or you set up your tent, whatever it is, and you inevitably have to go and get food from somewhere. Or even just walking around for the next five or six hours, it's nice to do it in something that feels a bit more like normal. I also think that taking some normal clothes that are suitable to sleep in as well are like a big preference so i'll always take like a pair of like my short short running shorts they're like my go-to so they are so short they are they're nearly wide fronts but the point is they are comfortable you can put them on instead of kit and a t-shirt or whatever and you just feel normal for what is essentially like quite a few hours mm. when you're not in cycling kit or sleeping yeah I think those things are really... Yeah, sometimes they're and, and, you know, it doesn't weigh much. A tiny pair of shorts, a tiny t-shirt, a couple hundred grams, whatever. Yeah, yep. it's good. no, that's no, true. You're, you're either packing... Are you are you packing for a trip where you'll sp spend time on the bike or spend time off the bike and that people need to think and decide? And it's a scale, of yeah. course. But... I, I kind of feel like in most cases, unless it's like a full-on, like, ultra event, the, you're, you're always going to have a number of hours off the bike. Mm-hmm. Okay. So don't forget that. And feel like a normal human. Mm. Like take you with your te toothbrush. Oh, yeah. You feel good afterwards. I remember Matt Falconer, who um, came podium the TCR, Transcontinental that, Race. Yeah. And he was looking for like which toothbrush would chop down the best in the shop. <laughs> Just have a tiny little toothbrush. But it makes you feel normal, makes you feel happy. I always take a Bluetooth speaker. Yeah. I like that. Play some music when you're in a quiet area. You play some music and you don't have to have headphones in. You can and, and hear what's going around you. Annoyingly, every time we've been away on some kind of trip, we've always gotten to take a Bluetooth speaker. Yeah, like, oh, I wish I had a Bluetooth speaker. But we also, we then decide to take to, to, to take sing. it upon ourselves to sing. Yeah, and we yeah, just yeah, yeah. Sing. We no, not, not everyone is as talented as us, so Jimmy. It's true. Mm. That's true. Camping versus hotels. Uh, you got to take a lot more stuff with you if you're camping. Yeah, I would say if you first, if this is your first time doing a trip, don't camp, or go to a campsite with that has some provisions. Uh, facilities. My so, if you are a person that already enjoys camping, has experience in camping, mm. did went to campsites as a kid, that kind of thing is completely normal and comfortable to you. You are going to be fine bike packing in that style. Mm -hmm. If you've never done it, anything like that, you're quite an indoorsy person, you've been on like fancy holidays your whole life, 
it's it's an acquired taste. And the last thing you want to do is ride seven hours and then put a tent up and not know how to do it. The, the, the best way it's been described to me by various ultra people and you is the best way to sleep in a tent is after three or four days, you are so knackered that you can sleep anywhere and therefore it's enjoyable. Mm -hmm. That'll be a timer on the bike trip. Yeah, yeah. yes. So yeah. The, the ultra guys, the real serious ultra guys, they invest in, they do the one man tent. Yeah. And it's a super lightweight tent and that's the most comfortable way to do it. Small, um, so instead of a bivy, they do like comfy sleeping bag, but a super lightweight one that's really yeah. expensive. And then one man tent. I think a lot, of, but then a lot of them will just, weren't at all yeah they'll just sleep on a well the ultra okay yeah if they're doing that tcr and stuff hotels the whole way oh that's a different so is it, is it like a fucking race it's, yeah. not, it's not for those guys i i uh, a lot of pre-book their hotels i had <laughs> i uh i like camping sometimes i've done a bit of it i hate bike packing with a tent yeah um it takes up a lot of space as well if you what what are the um you, yeah sleeping mat Bivy and a sleeping, sleeping bag. bag. Yeah, that's whole tail fin gone, or a whole pannier gone. Yeah, just from that. But then you don't have much more stuff if you go if you go lean, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I the other option then. Yeah, is most like, people don't take laptop, camera, cameras, six chargers, GoPros and chargers. Yeah. yeah. When you take that out, it's actually drone. Not that bad. I carried a drone. Okay, a Mavic. Not even a small drone. Not like your one. A Mavic Pro. Uh, Mavic Pro Three. Like it's this big for the viewers watching the video version of this podcast. It's, it's about a kilo, isn't about it? A ki no, it's more than that. More than a kilo. I carried it and the controller is another thing and the charger. It's big. Yeah. And I used it once in Miami, cycling from Miami to LA. I didn't, I didn't, it just stayed in my bag. There we go. And now it's broken. <laughs> um, th so the other option is your preference, which is hotels. Mm. Um, B and B's hotels, that kind of thing. One of the most asked questions I get is bikes in hotel rooms. Yeah. How do you get your bike in a hotel room? I have two methods. You ask the hotel beforehand. <laughs> beforehand. Yeah. And just tell them you're coming. And I would use that tactic in Spain, mainland Europe, because in my experience there is they get a bit funny about bikes in hotels. America, don't even bother asking. Just go in. They just don't care. They don't care. Right. Nobody there cares at all. I've never been challenged whatsoever. Um, sometimes I'll forget to ask the hotel. And even if I am in Europe somewhere, I'll just try and do it anyway and just try and sneak it in. The worst case is they, because uh, we had this in Barcelona. They always give you another option, a luggage room. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's just whether you're comfortable leaving your bike in a luggage room. We didn't end up having to do it in Barcelona because we talked them around. We did do it in London. But I think we were at a level of fatigue where if the bikes got stolen, we didn't even care. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, Usually they're, they're very helpful, aren't they? They're very helpful. I think I think the hotel one, I guess, is... I think is people are too scared. I, I, the question, I just get asked so many times. And I think it's just people are a bit too nervous to ask because it's weird, isn't it? Like, go bike in a hotel room. But there's always... They're, they're, you're paying for a hotel. They're there to help. I would always just assume like, you could do it. As long as your bike's not like a man with bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, you keep your bike clean. Of course. Uh, what I don't like about hotels is you you have to check in, you have to check out. It, it's like it's you end up spending an hour a day faffing about with like hotel admin. Mm -hmm. And I know that's just the same as like setting up a bivy or a tent or whatever. Uh, obviously, you get the luxury of a bed and a shower. We had this in a thing. Two bikes, one wheelchair. The amount of times... We booked well, forty-eight times. We booked an, an accessible room. Eighty percent of the time, we got to the hotel, and then they didn't put us in an accessible room. So, for those that don't know, the accessible room is because Francis rode across America with Justin, who is a wheelchair user. Yeah, I mean, he's literally there at reception, sat in a wheelchair, and they still put us in the normal room. <laughs> and then you have to go down, take. We then put my bike, a hand bike, him with a flag, <laughs> me with all of the trailer and all of the stuff into a lift <laughs> up to the room, get there. We go in. It's not the right room. <laughs> Why? I should have filmed that more. I should have put that in the videos more I, in I, hindsight, just to show that like, cause it just, a, why is it such a problem? 
can I give you some feedback? Yeah. Maybe leave all of that stuff in reception and go and check the room. Well, we ended up, yeah. <laughs> you know the level of fatigue that you we were in London? Yeah, yeah imagine that times 10. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no thanks. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I, go, go, the hotel thing that I don't like is there's, there's something unpleasant for me. I know you, you're very comfortable. But there's something unpleasant to me about every day being in a different room that's a bit different you have to work out where the lights you, you know like there's all these weird little things that are just like doesn't sound annoy like me. whereas <laughs> if you are camping and you're comfortable with camping it's always the same thing you've got your equipment you know how your equipment works you know where it is you pull it out you set it up it just happens to be under a different tree mm. um there is something about hotels i don't like and of course you're less connected to like nature nature yeah which Arguably is also a good thing. <laughs> Let's fly. Uh, the last thing is what to do when things don't go to plan. What do you do? They often don't go to plan. Things go wrong. I would say preempt things going wrong. Don't book your hotels until two nights before, one night before. Same day. I do same day. Yeah. Um, Booking.com is really good for that. Exactly. Because you can cancel. Not sponsored by Booking.com. However, sadly, sadly, yeah, we'd love to be. Uh, Booking.com is really good, and it does. You can stick to one. There's Booking.com or Hotels.com. It's the red one. Yeah. Uh, both of them. If you book a bunch of hotels, you can do it by the calendar, and you can see what's coming up, and you can adjust things and move things around really yeah. easily. I, I find uh, just yeah. stick to one instead of hopping around between them because then you lose what's going on and it's yeah what when tired when we did Spain what I particularly liked about it is you always just like you basically get to where you need to be for the night you you booked it probably in the morning or in most of the cases we booked it when we stopped for lunch yeah, yeah. like literally the, like a couple of hours before and then like you get there and you're kind of like I can't even remember what this place is you just open the app and it's like Right. Yeah. There it is. Let me get yeah, there. Yeah, Bosh, yeah. there it is. Let's ride to it. I thought that was wicked. Yeah. This is the pre-preparation with, with everything, including your bike and equipment, just to remember you're going to be tired. Even if you're doing short rides. Yeah. What do we do? 70k some days? Yeah. It but it was lumpy. To 100 and... Yeah, it was lumpy. You hadn't been riding loads before. And I'd been riding quite a bit, but it was still it still tires you out. Yeah. It's a lot of thinking, a lot of we well, make filming videos and you're meeting people and you're ordering stuff in a different language and you know, like all those little tiny things which are not a, a big fuss at all, especially if you're on holiday. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it becomes like, Oh yeah, oh, I need to I need to order another sandwich. What's the word for sandwich again? And do all that. It adds up. What is the word for sandwich? Well bocadillo. Oh, there we go. It's uh oh that's French uh, it's French. <laughs> it's just Spanish. <laughs> wow. It's like it's the the Spanish the thing. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, so I guess I guess stuff doesn't go to plan. Be cool with that. Mm. It's not going to be perfect. You will end up at a different place. Stuff will break. Things will happen. Mm. Stuff breaks. Just it happens. Go with it. Time for another round of overrated, underrated. I'm going to read out a list of things, and you're going to tell me if they are underrated or overrated. Excellent. Are you ready? Yes. Chamois cream. Overrated. I agree. I've never ever used it. Wait, does that mean I? How do you? I'm know? not allowed to have an opinion. Yeah, you're not allowed an opinion. Yeah. I've never, I've n never needed it or even considered using it. I think it is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. I know some people religiously use it. Yes. I do think that... People get addicted to it. Yeah. They use it once and then like, oh, now I have to use it. Yeah. Using it. Really. Yeah. I don't, I don't even, I don't even quite understand how it makes anything different. So I think the idea of it... Well, is, some of them are, are, are antibacterial. Yeah. So if you were doing... Maybe if you're doing like an ultra thing where you're in the same bib shorts for two weeks, mm. it might be a consideration. Perhaps. But then you've done that and not needed it. No. But uh, nah, I haven't though, because I've washed my kit in between. Oh, yeah. I've washed my not kit every night. There, yeah. yeah. Mm. So I've never done a, a, a race like where it's no sleep. No sleep, no washing. No sleep, no washing. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's needed. I think, I, think a best, I think a more important thing is a good set of shorts. Mm. A good saddle and a bike fit. Yeah. And um, the bike fits the 100%. The, the saddle sores are almost always caused by an asymmetry, a, asymmetrical interaction with the saddle, which is why they're always on the same side for people. So it's Fact pressure. Speculation. Sort of thing. No, there's James's uh, anecdotal evidence. Our friend James, the bike fitter, who's probably done more bike fits than most people in the world. 
than, no, than us. <laughs> Definitely more than that. <laughs> not the best bike fitter in the world. This is his words. Not the best bike fitter in the world, but probably the best at talking about it. <laughs> uh, definitely is. <laughs> uh, next up, base layers. Overrated. Yes. But I still wear one, and probably for a different reason to why they are sold to people. I'm intrigued. So typically they are sold or marketed to people as like a base layer to wick away sweat. But that isn't why they're any good. The reason I like wearing a base layer is it adds a level of modesty. I uh, do not want to... But what, what, what it does is it just kind of makes me feel more like... That's what Chris says. Lovely. Yeah. It makes me feel more yeah, lovely yeah, yeah, when yeah, I'm yeah. cycling. It kind of like... Yeah. Almost not that it sucks me in a little bit. It just makes me feel more comfortable with it on. That is uh, a valid that, reason, and that's why I use one. Fair enough. And I think there's a lot of people that use one for the same reason. Yeah, it is going to make you warmer. It's an extra layer of fabric. Exactly. So the the weird there's that weird myth of oh it wicks away sweat, it makes you cooler. It is another layer of fabric, and your jersey, if it's made out of the right material, will also be wicking. Also be wicking. Yeah. Um, I don't like them. Overrated, uh, in my opinion. Mo mainly because you can't take them off easily. So if you're right, if you if you do a bike ride, temperature changes. It always does. You go out in the morning and you want more layers on, and then you want to take stuff off. A, a gilet, I can take that off while riding mm -hmm. um, and having a chat to the person next to me, and not even you know think about it. A base layer is significantly more difficult to take off. It's underneath your bibs of your bib shorts. Yep, usually. So but whereas the what, the modesty that it adds would give me the, com uh, the comfort that I can go, oh, it's warm. Well, I'll just open my jersey. Yeah. Whereas if I didn't have a base layer, I wouldn't open my You'd jersey. You'd be paid off by a big base layer. 650B wheels. Um, oh, this is, this, is, this is a contentious one as well. Yeah, it's quite difficult. They are overrated. They're not... So, the by who? Nick? No, well, I, I think the idea is... Not many people even consider them as... Uh, options especially it's true I think, think, think about road cyclists don't think about gravel think about road yeah but if if you're think if you're in the space where 650 b are being mentioned i think they're being over mentioned okay. so you've gone to a bike shop you're like i'd like to buy a gravel bike they're probably gonna go do you want 650 b or 700 650 b are cool do you reckon? Yeah, That's I do. Pick. No, I don't, I don't think that many shops are doing that. But but then like off the shelf good. bikes are now coming as 650B. A lot of off shelf bikes aren't even rated for 650Bs. The warranty will be out the window. You can't ride a 650B on the Scots that we have. You do though. Yeah. The <laughs> warranty. <laughs> a little. I I think I think they are overrated. I yep. think I think it's like a cool thing. I have 650Bs on my gravel bike. I'll be honest, I, I, t I talk about this, so I don't notice the difference. Not that much difference. 650Bs with massive tyres on versus 700s with less massive tyres on, I, wouldn't, I don't even notice the difference between it. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people will notice the difference. And if they're trying to increase the capacity of like what, the tyre they can squeeze in, it's a good little trick. But you're buying a whole set of wheels, and then it's all different inner tubes, and then you pick up the wrong one, and then... Oh. Yeah. But... Uh, are they underrated or overrated? Am I allowed to say neither? No. No. They're underrated. Good little wheel. For what? Being a wheel. <laughs> they're really, they're very, just like 700C, 650Bs are all over the world. And if we go back to my Vietnam example before, you can get 650 inner tubes and tires very easily. Well, I, I, guess, I guess we should probably explain. So 650B is... A smaller wheel. 27 and a half inch. And a 700 is 20, 29. 29, same as a 29 yeah. mounted by wheels. So it's essentially the exact same thing, but just a smaller wheel. Yes, which often leads to you being able to fit in a bigger tyre yeah. um, into your frame. Not in all circumstances, because of the shape of stays. Yeah. Um, but in most cases, you will end up with a lower bottom bracket close to the ground, unless you put on a much bigger tyre, higher volume tyre, and then it kind of brings it back up again. Yeah. But certainly on the Scott, I notice pedal strike, the bottom bracket is lower. And that's an inconvenience. It, interestingly, on my gravel bike, which is a custom steel bike, it has been built exclusively around 650B. Oh, cool. So it's, it's for that. Yeah. yeah. I, don't even, I don't even know. I guess you could put 700s in it still. But could you? I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. 
try it. I, I did mention it to busy to to busy to Billy who built my bike. Busy. I was like, <laughs> I should start calling that. Yeah. Um, I mentioned it to him. I was like, I was like, you know, it'd be cool if I, if I could put seven hundred on if you want. He was just like, no. <laughs> just like I'm not, even, I'm not even. I'm not even. I'm whole thing around. Yeah. Just, I'm not even considering it. <laughs> Mountain biking. It's very well rated. It's probably bigger than road cycling. So I'm going to say overrated. <laughs> Purely logically, but is yes because everyone loves it. Yeah, for good it's reason. Massive. It's huge. Yeah. It's like it's it's significant. I I think I've done some basic mountain biking and i think it's okay i don't love it you did very well you rode some you rode a black trail the first ever trail i took you to <laughs> <laughs> they're kind of tame you did very well that's a tame black yeah it's one of those be like, because it's the first one you do at the bike park yeah they call it black but i don't think it actually is it's more like a red um however a red is still significant if you were to take someone who's never mountain bike before down a, a, a normal red trail it's quite a shock me people I haven't ridden... Have I ridden a full sus? I haven't. Who are yeah. yeah. Was yeah. that a full sus? Yeah, I was full sus. Right, okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, then we did it again. That makes it full sus, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. It's a, a talent compensator. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Big time. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't It was. hard. The bike does definitely does the work for you. Yeah. Uh, I do think it's overrated, though. I'm not, I'm not running out. I'm not going out of my way to be like, oh, I've got to get a mountain bike. This is the best thing in the world. I was, kind of, I was like, ah, it's... I love it, but it's the, the barrier is getting to the trails. It's more of a well, you ride, really just ride your bike. Just ride there, yeah. So I ride two hours there, probably more <laughs> on on a Hamsterlift. <laughs> nah, I reckon it's two hours. It's less. It's, it's an hour and a half ride to get to Hamsterlift. Hour and a half ride, but it's actually three miles. And then yeah, and then you do what an hour on the trails before you then get tired and have to ride home an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. Speed play. Hmm. They they are overrated. They're they're kind of like this like cool or at least they were this kind of like cool product that if you wanted to be cool you had to have speed speed to speed split it out pays, um, but they're just completely unnecessary. Yes, uh, loads of other pedal systems work as well, if not better. Re- referred to by James as a bike fitter's nightmare. It's too much adjustability for most people. He says. Yeah, but you, they you used just- to have some useful attachments they had like a four aft extender mm-hmm. uh long axle versions which both i think the long axle version you you can get from the new wahoo speed play but you can't get it vaporware right so it says it's available but it's not right um the four aft extender plate's gone i rode speed plays for seven years mm-hmm. when i first started riding the reason i first bought them was I, it was like, like literally first road bike, first shoe system. I had, I had been using SPDs for a bit. So like mountain bike cleats. Mm-hmm. And the reason I was like, right, it's time for road cleats. Cause I'm going to start doing some racing, some triathlons, whatever. Um, I went for speed play cause I like the double sided. It's going to be easier to get in. Mm. I've since used other systems and it's always just really easy to get in. It is. <laughs> so I definitely wasted a lot of money because that. they're significantly more, or they were like a hundred and something quid for a pedal system. Even the chromely ones. Even yeah, yeah. Before, yeah. Yeah. Whereas you could get like, you know, 105 Shimano ones and they were probably like 30 quid or something or other. Um, I'll always like the walkability of them. 134 pounds. For the basic ones, the, the basic no. Wahoo. That's not really changed that much in no. the best part of the day. 180 for the uh, nicer axled versions. Steel, it's, just, it's, steel just, it's just a weight difference for the higher up you go. Uh, yeah. Uh, walking in them was very, I always liked that because they're like. Well, they made a walkable cleat. Well, it's just a cover. So it's just a cover over the yeah. cleat, which made it, would, and they, I think they pretty much come standard with it. Um, Did they, didn't they release it as an aero cover? And then they realized that. No one cared about that, and they I made think it the, the walking one. No, I think that's a different thing. Is that a different thing again? Because there is there is a single sided version of it, which is an aero one. Right. So the underside is like clip onto the existing pedal. Yeah. There's just an extra piece in the middle, and then that makes it aero. Uh, well, no, it's just the the other. No, no. So there's a separate pedal system, I believe, mm. where the what it's just like one side of it is just concave. Yeah. So there were some small benefits. Like I, I think the reason a lot of pros used them when it when it was their choice because it was because they were faster yeah marginally 
and the stack was very very low yeah, yeah. so you could pedal around corners better yeah but again very marginal doesn't matter to most people no uh i used to wear them out a lot i never did see i didn't have i mine would i think so this is well th- I, I i think it's more a case of you were wearing them out and you just didn't notice the lateral rock that occurs well again you already know how loose i like my cleats anyway yeah it's probably happy right yeah you're probably like oh they feel loose and but it's it's that movement it's the lateral play and they get that very quickly some people clearly don't care or don't notice yeah it doesn't bother um whereas i get i got pain knee pain it band pain i just touched my microphone did it make a weird noise um so overrated in my opinion it's a shame they've removed like they were better and now they've they've lost features next up coffee underrated no over oh god this is this is an aggressive list you're coming from the the, this is the man Mm. who quit coffee but took caffeine pills every day pro plus for how long why well um I'm, well, what I'm several is not often. Why? What I learned was that I was addicted to caffeine, the habit of coffee. Oh, so um, if I I could wake up, this bear in mind, I'm not this, but I was really bad. This is when I'm, I was living in London and I was working full time on Atticus. Emily wasn't full time on Atticus at that point. I spent a lot of time on my own, so my only friends were the people that worked at the coffee shop. So I would. This is, I'm not even joking, it's a true story. So I, so I would walk to my, so my studio, so the original Attica studio was like 500 metres from our flat, and then there was a coffee shop probably 200 metres from that. Um, so the only contact I would have with people in a day would be the postman when he would click, collect the post, mm-hmm. and the two times I would visit, or at least two times that I'd visit the coffee shop. So I became heavily addicted to coffee. Uh, so in an attempt to reduce my outgoings, <laughs> I decided to get pro plus. So I'd wake up in the morning and rather than beeline for the coffee shop or make a coffee, I'd have two pro plus, which is the equivalent of like an espresso. Yeah. And then like, it's kind of like a headache. You take some, some paracetamol and then all of a sudden you don't realize that you haven't got a headache anymore. You just don't. And it was the same. I'll take two pro plus and then I would just not be thinking about coffee or energy and then I realized how addicted I was to, well, caffeine ultimately and mm. the process of it. I wasn't thinking about, oh, I should go and see my, my, my guys at the shop. Yeah. That was just a cover up. Do you feel dead? But when you woke up in the morning, did you feel like you needed to go have a coffee? I used to take Pro Plus on bike packing trips because I had to be caffeinated. To wake up, to wake, be awake. Well, just to, it was like, it was like I needed, I would wake up with like headaches and like fuzz and I had to have caffeine to then like level out. It, I was like addicted to caffeine. Wow. Straight up addicted to it. Yeah. Um, I, I've definitely been there. At the moment, I I wait. I try to wait 90 minutes after waking up before I have a coffee. And I have a black bo- coffee. I'm boring. Boring. <laughs> but but I don't feel like I need one. So it's not hard to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas that would have been difficult for me. You have to like get through that bit. And then I probably have maybe have one more in the day. This is water. I just have one today. And it's quite a nice happy medium i think yeah i it gets it you you definitely feel more alert and you feel very focused and it makes me feel nice when, awake but i don't need it and that's important i think when i left london i used that as an opportunity to like reset mm-hmm. so i i'm in that place now i don't need coffee but i can have coffee yeah so i i have i will regularly have coffee i will always have coffee every day no uh eh, most days most days but uh, but i don't yeah it's fine it's when i what i'll get up and i'll have one and i also have a lot i drink instant now most of the time is it overrated or underrated coffee or instant coffee coffee uh uh oh i'm saying underrated especially based on used in the correct way to aid performance not only for cycling but in life I would say it is overrated because it's very expensive and you do not need it. That's true. You don't need it. Next up, listeners take over. And we have a question from Nathan in Boston. Hi, Jimmy and Francis. I bought an e-bike last year for commuting and I've been getting disparaging comments from cyclists saying that it's cheating. doesn't count as biking and that I need to use a real bike. What are your opinions on this way of thinking? Those guys... That have said those things 
I'm... I immediately felt enraged at the idea that this guy is being berated for having an e-bike and I wanted to fight those people who were fighting off. And then I realized that was an irrational response. So I've calmed, I've, I've, got, I've just let that one, that one go. Okay. Um, you, Nathan, you should not hang around with those people. Yes. And Continue if, riding your e-bike and have fun because they're wicked. And if they are your friends that you ride with, just every time you have the opportunity to screw, to, to absolutely drop the shit out of them, do, do it. it. Every time, and and just stick your finger up them, and lol at how <laughs> weak their bikes are compared to yours. You have to do it uh, one hand on the handlebars as well. Yeah, that's the rules. Well, it's no handing. That's the uh, the. Uh, it's not a law, but it is a rule. Yeah, yeah. Whenever you're riding an e-bike, you do one hand. Prefer, and if you don't have one, install <laughs> install like a throttle, so you don't even need to pedal. And and then, <laughs> and then just like ride around them in circles <laughs> as they're like struggling and just loll at them. I love an e-bike. I think it's brilliant. It's so a father can ride with a son both way rounds, both yeah. both ways round. Yeah, both, blah, 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 blah. yeah. Been a long podcast. T- tandem. Um, it's so people that have different equipment, like some hand bike. You can put e-bikes on them, and then you can be super fast uphill, which is quite difficult because hand bikes are heavier. Brilliant. The more the technology advances, the more exciting it gets. And if people start replacing their cars with stuff like cargo bikes, also wicked. Mm-hmm. Question from Alan. How do you break down your rides over long distances in terms of how far you'll go at once and how long the rest stop is? To the casual viewer, it appears you're just going balls to the wall all day long with five minute rests to fill water. You appear to be an absolute monster. For example, if you had a hundred kilometers to go, would you do it all at once or break it in half? And if you broke it in half, how big of a gap would you have? I'm wanting to do a 100k ride this year. I've done 65k on the Zwift with no brakes, and I'm hoping with a break or two, I can make the distance. I want to start on this one. So firstly, Francis is a monster. So whatever Francis is capable of doing, he isn't the person that you should use as the benchmark for what you're capable of doing. That is the caveat to that. The second thing is, don't think that you have to do anything continuously. Stop as much as you need. Stop every half an hour if you want, if that's, if that's what's needed for you to achieve what you want to achieve. Like it, there, there, isn't, there isn't a rule, there isn't a system. It's just whatever you need, whatever your body's saying. Like stopping more. Me personally, I hate stopping because for me, my body then goes, I'm done. Don't want to do any more. But... You have to stop, so I do. Mm-hmm. So when I stop, I like for example, when we're in Spain, I like to make more of a big deal of it. So it's almost like it's a separate ride. Mm. Kind of like commuting to work. You ride into work, you, we sit in a coffee shop for as long as I can convince you to sit in a coffee shop or a I restaurant. I wonder what the videos he's watching, because I feel like we film a lot of stops. Like the ride across America, we, it's just, it's a little bit of riding footage. It, yeah, but you're riding across America. Yeah, it's quite far. Like that is like, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles mm. i reckon i do an hour for that ride hour and a half to two hours of riding and then a stop and there might be a mini like micro stop in between where we're like what well, should we just stop and eat some sweets and then we pull over on the side of the road eat fight like two two or three minutes film some stupid stuff and then go but but ultimately that hour and a half to two hours is just something that works for you yeah so like if someone needs to stop 20 minutes, half an hour, then yeah, do it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like ultimately it's just do whatever you need to do. I think like stopping more but keeping it short would be a that's a good compromise if you're worried about like getting to the end of a ride before it's dark. It's the accumulative time. It does add up, doesn't it? It's like when you do you remember when we did the Everest, the BMX Everest. Yeah. And I felt like I was stopping for 30 seconds at the bottom of the climb every you know or if that yeah and then accumulatively the time that added up was just like two hours yeah three hours <laughs> where does it go so it, it does catch you off guard so i understand the concern from people mm-hmm. however if you need to stop you need to stop yeah there's not a rule no, there's, there's no rule there's, it's, it's, and i think a lot of the videos there's definitely circumstances where well a lot of it looks like we're smashing it what did he say? It just looks like we're going balls to the wall all day long. I'd make the videos look like that. Like when I pull the camera out and then 
people tend to then ride out of the saddle and they just do silly stuff. Like if I'm with Nick or Ben or you, you just sprint, don't you? It's like, oh, he's got well, a camera, I, I I'll do a sprint. I don't, but you'll always say, do a sprint. Oh, well, that's for the produced <laughs> videos. But like the, the videos where we're just doing a ride, people yeah. tend to play up to the camera. Yeah. And then in the editing, which is where the video is really made, that's the edit is everything. I choose the bits which look the fastest. And then you just go cool. speed up by 30. <laughs> I'm 30. <percent. laughs> that you don't speed police. Do. There's actually a, um, there's an Instagram page called Speed Police, which is a mountain bike. Like, for, like people, they po repost people's videos and they say Speed Police caught you. And there's people speeding up their mountain bike rides. Oh, I see, yeah. I see. Right. There's also Pressure Police. It's a good one. Because if you, you do like a, you scrub the turns and you can get your, do the little, like, oh, I can't remember the name of it. I'm not a mountain biker. Yeah. There's a little thing where you like go around, push corner. into the toe, push in really hard and it skips the back wheel and creates a load of roost. Um, and if you have really low pressure, it will do that more readily. And it's pressure police will be on to you. Sounds like mountain biking is full of elitist. Uh, pretty much same as road cycling. So yes. If you have any more questions or stories, please send them in to wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk. That is all for this episode. If you watch the podcast on YouTube, please subscribe. And if you're listening and you like this episode, please follow and give us a review because it really helps. Thank you. And see you next time. Link, here come to